Now, when discussing the Mona Lisa in painting circles, there are two terms that come up pretty commonly. One is the term chiaroscuro, which I'll have written out in key terms, and the other one is sfumato. Uh, both of these are sort of tr tricky Italian terms. Like chiaroscuro uh, is basically it's the gradual transition between areas of light and shadow, like you see up here in this cheek where you have this highlight that's hitting the face of the cheek here, and as it wraps around, it gradually merges into the shadow, and the shadow gradually merges into the hair, but you have that very subtle transition which creates all these very minute gradients. That's something that Leonardo da Vinci did probably better than ooh, probably 95% of the other artists of the Renaissance. It was something he was very good at, but just coming up with those subtle variations, uh, which is, again, it's remarkable not just because he was good at it, because, but because everybody wasn't painting that way. Even if we look back at, the say, the Botticellis. Botticelli, it's kind of hard to make out here. I wish I could zoom in again, but you can see with this sort of an outline around the figures, and it looks like there's an outline and they've almost been painted in. Well, da Vinci didn't rely on those outlines to determine where the end of something is and the beginning of the next thing is. It's just a, one thing merges into the other, which creates a, a level of realism or naturalism that's beyond anything that Botticelli could have gotten with that particular technique. The sfumato, which also be listed in the key terms, is a smoky atmospheric haze. The, uh, Leonardo da Vinci had this uh, almost like a tint that he would put up, which would soften the light and create a very soft cast glow on whoever the subject matter was, which makes makes for softer shadows and more even lighting. And it also makes everything look I, I have, like it has this nice warm yellow tint to it. Um, this is also due partially because of the, uh, the varnishes that he used. They yellow a little bit as they age, so that's got something to do with it. Um, a lot of discussion in regards to uh, the unlevel horizon line in the background, this sort of road that disappears, this bridge that goes nowhere. There's a lot of different things that uh, could be symbolic visual elements. Um, in fact, oh, there's a really interesting uh, new thing that was discovered that underneath one of the arches in this bridge and in the reflection on, I can't remember which pupil it is, but there's a slight glare that's being picked up there. And they have found with microscopes, like tiny initials and, uh, and numbers hidden in them. Uh, this probably doesn't have anything to do with the Da Vinci Code or anything like that. It's probably the, uh, the initials of the um, husband or of their child. And then um, the number underneath the bridge was probably the date of their anniversary or something like that. But um, you, Leonardo da Vinci was a fascinating guy, but not nearly as fascinating as uh, the da Vinci Code would want you to believe. But uh, remember, Chiroscura and Sfumato specifically in regards to this particular picture. Now, Raphael, as far as I'm concerned, his, his career peaked right here with the School of Athens. is a very, very ambitious, groundbreaking piece that he did, which established him as one of the absolute, like that's why he's a Ninja Turtle in my opinion, is because of this specific commission that he did. He was hired by the Pope himself while Michelangelo was working on the Sistine Chapel ceiling right next to where this is at. Raphael was in here. It's no more than say 50 or 100 yards away. You know, two of the greatest painters who have ever lived were both doing commissions for the Pope uh, in the Vatican uh, during this exact same time period. And that wasn't an accident. The Pope realized that and the only way to really stop the cultural growth that was being spurned by the Medici family was just to steal all the artists out of Florence and pay them a good deal of money to be working on projects inside of the Vatican, which would then restore the, the Pope's authority over the way the culture developed and then handicap the Medici family to some extent. And it was somewhat successful. It really did. It, it was a huge time for patronage and building. Uh, within the Vatican, it brought attention back to the church. Um, St. Peter's Basilica was, was, was restored and rebuilt during the same time period. There was, there's going to be a video on that. Just like there's a video that explains all of the really valuable symbolism that's sort of included within this, within this particular image. Now, symbolism, not terribly common in Italian rena in the, during the Italian Renaissance, at least not compared to what we're going to see in the Northern Renaissance. So. The, don't get the, the level of symbolism, the figurative symbolism involved here, um, somehow lead you into believing this is somehow Northern Renaissance later. 
But do watch the video that explains who all these people are and why they're here. Uh, man, the Pieta. This is an absolutely jaw-dropping piece of sculpture that Michelangelo did when he was, I believe, 26 years old. Very young. So young, nobody believed that someone as young as him had done this. So after delivering this on commission, he heard rumors that other people, other people were taking credit for his work. So he climbed up on the lap of the Virgin Mary and actually carved his name. Michelangelo Buonarotti Florentine did this, and written in Latin. But it's inscribed on there for all of perpetuity. It is permanent, and nobody's taking credit for Michelangelo's work. Um, yeah, I could t take a whole class to discuss this one particular sculpture, but... I'll just say that just be sure to check out the Michelangelo video that's posted on Blackboard. It'll give you a lot more information about all of these pieces, especially the Sistine Chapel ceiling, uh, which is possibly uh, the thing that he's most commonly associated with. And I think that he would be um, pretty disappointed by that. Just watch the video and it'll sort of explain that whole thing. Last Judgment, I believe the final large scale painting that he ever did. I think it was 75 when he did this, or he at least started working on it. Anyway, also architect. Uh, the term Renaissance man is a common term that's used to describe someone who's good at doing everything. Uh, and I think that's due in part to the fact that they assumed that if someone had the, the level of genius necessary to become a really groundbreaking, proficient, artist, be it sculptor or painter or anything else, and like, surely they were smart enough to be an architect and anything else that they felt like being, and Leonardo da Vinci um, absolutely was this in spades, which set a really high bar for everybody else who was good at maybe one or two specific things during the Renaissance, but Michelangelo proved not just to be good at painting, or really he was a sculptor by trade, he, he also dabbled in painting, he did do architecture. He did do some engineering. Michelangelo himself, he, he played musical instruments. He was good at poetry. Uh, Michelangelo, very well-rounded individual, and also much like Leonardo da Vinci, also homosexual. Be sure to watch that video. It explains a lot of this stuff. Let's see. Now, we're going to skip most of these and focus on one particular person. Uh, the one part about this is, that gives it a little bit of context is that Giorgione, Titian, Veronese and Tintoretto are all painters from Venice. Now, if we go back to that very first map, you'll see that Venice is just barely in the Italian peninsula. Venice is up here, right? It's touching the Italian peninsula, but it's also getting a lot of influence from areas north of Italy. So in two ways, it's much more similar to the artwork of the Northern Renaissance than to the Italian Renaissance. I'll try not to get into it too much right now, but just know that um, the paintings tend to be smaller because they were done for, for private families instead of large cathedrals. Um, in addition to that, the work has a tendency to be a little bit more secular, like this one doesn't really have anything to do with the church. Eh, that one might vaguely be a veiled reference. This one doesn't. Feast in the House of Levi is a, a reference to the Gospels, and The Last Supper is definitely too. But you get a nice mixture of things that are inspired by spirituality and some that aren't. Now, Titian. Titian was trained specifically by Giorgione. Giorgione was the first, like, big-name artist in Venice. And he set up a workshop where he trained both Titian and Veronese. And then Titian ended up training this guy, Tintoretto. So there's a really nice, convenient lineage. Because Venice was kind of small and isolated, like, it's a lot easier to, to study them by individual artists, but the one that's most significant to us right now is Titian. That's this guy right here. It's specifically this painting, the Venus of Urbino. And you can see where there's a strong Italian influence in uh, the way that the figures are approached. They have a nice sense of mass and volume, a uh, nice level of naturalism and detail, which was very common amongst other Italian artists. But what you have here that's not common for most Italian artwork is that you've included a little bit of symbolism here in the color. This green curtain here represents uh, wealth and fertility. The roses that she's holding uh, symbolize love. The white of this bed sheet represents passion. I mean, represents uh, purity, I'm sorry. The red represents passion. Uh, the fact that you have this dog sort of curled up at her feet. Dogs represent loyalty and fidelity. 
And the reason these things are here is kind of explained by what's happening back here. Um, this is supposed to be a bride who's in the process of getting dressed for her for her wedding ceremony. And these are the her two maids getting out her dressing gowns or even her bridal gown specifically. Um, looks like like this little girl's back here throwing up in this in this chest, but she's actually you know getting out her clothing, and that's why it's okay for her to be laying around naked, is because we know that she's not just someone who lays around naked. That would be a prostitute. She's not a prostitute. She's a nice lady who's getting married. Look at her. So this painting gets referenced and replicated a lot, and we're going to see a couple of those things, but um, the story to this one specifically. It's one that I think is, I don't know, I can't think of a better word than just disturbing. Uh, the Venus of Urbino is a painting that was commissioned by uh, a descendant of the Duke of Urbino. Long story, this man, is a 35-year-old man, has just gotten married to a 10-year-old girl, and this painting was done to sort of commemorate that marriage. This is definitely not a 10-year-old girl, but this painting was commissioned specifically to hang in the house of this duke who wanted to remind his young bride of, of her wifely duties by re reminding her to stay faithful um, and to be fertile, but also to be passionate. Uh, there were different times. It was undoubtedly a political marriage, but still, it's hard to look past something just like that. So if there are themes that emerge during the Renaissance, it's just that Exploration is great. A lot of different things are going on. There's a lot of secular artwork that's happening. There are a lot of big name artists that are appearing. Like you finally get these superstars like the, the Gabertis and the Brunelleschis and you get your Ninja Turtle figures. And that's because all of a sudden, thanks to humanism, we're able to acknowledge if somebody's really good at something or if I'm really good at something, humanism has allowed people to really celebrate themselves and their greatness. And beyond celebrate it, to really indulge in how good you are and just to see what your ca full capabilities are, I, that is in some ways seen as being as godly as possible. It's like what makes you close to God is being capable, is, is having uh, critical thought, is being able to, to acknowledge your own consciousness and acknowledge that greatness. Um, these are the sort of the driving factors of the Renaissance and why you see so many things happening uh, and again, in such a condensed period of time, especially when compared to the Middle Ages.